All right, I'm going to go off and hit live for us. Lee disappeared. I guess that means we've begun. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Patient Zero and the Making of the AIDS Epidemic, hosted by the GLBT Historical Society. My name is Terry Buswick, and I'm the Executive Director of the GLBT Historical Society, and I'm here to introduce today's event and the moderator. But first, I just want to take a moment to, to acknowledge that the GLBT Historical Society is based on Ohlone tribal land. And I invite any Indigenous folks with us today to make themselves visible in the chat and be recognized as we honor the contemporary and then ancestral lives America, of America's Indigenous people. Um, also, I want to thank my colleague Lee Pfeffer, um, the Museum Experience Manager at the Society, for all their work behind the scenes in organizing today's event. So this reading and discussion with Richard A. McKay. Hi, Richard. The yeah. author of The Patient Zero and the Making of the AIDS Ep Epidemic is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel and our website. If you are watching with us on Zoom, we welcome your active participation in the forum and we encourage you to post questions for the moderator or panel or the speaker in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and post any comments in the chat box. So many people are going to be watching live on Facebook and we welcome you all, but please note that while we try, to, we'll try to monitor your comments, our panel will not see your comments and questions there in real time. So uh, you need to register uh, on Zoom and participate on the event, uh, which is free, um, and participate that way if you want to like engage with these speakers. So. With that, I want to say that uh, the GLBT Historical Society was founded in 1985 and is recognized internationally as a leader in this field of LGBTQ public history. Our mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, and make accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. Our operations are centered around two sites, the GLBT Historical Society Museum, located since 2011, in the heart of San Francisco's Castro neighborhood and the Dr. John P. DiCecco Archives and Research Center in the Mid-Market District. So although our physical locations are currently closed due to the pandemic, we expect to reopen soon within public health guidelines. In the meantime, please do check out our growing array of exhibitions, events, and archival resources at glbthistory.org. And finally, um, I've got to uh, make a small appeal for support. So I want to <laughs> Thank all our members and donors who make our work possible. If you are not currently a card-carrying member of the GLBT Historical Society, please consider joining today. And members get a variety of perks, including a 20% discount on purchases of cool swag on our website. Also, be sure to join us for our annual gala, Reunion Making History, on October 16th. We have a fabulous lineup of entertainment planned as, as the society's family comes together to celebrate some very special history makers in our community. Tickets are available with a donation in any amount on our website at glbthistory.org slash gala. Now, on to today's event. I'm very excited about Patient Zero and the Making of the AIDS Epidemic with author Richard A. McKay, moderated by Gerard Koskovich. Pronouns he, him, his. Koskovich is a San Francisco public historian and rare book dealer. A founding member of the GLBT Historical Society, he has been active in the movement to create LGBTQ archives and museums for nearly four decades and has curated numerous exhibitions. Koskovich has presented widely, including talks at the Louvre, Kyoto University, and Oxford University, and has published extensively in English and French. Most recently, he has focused on the work of Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, uh, the History of Queer History in the United States and LGBTQ Place-Based History. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gerard to introduce the author and lead the discussion. And I will hop off and watch the live stream on Facebook. Thank you very much, Terry. Welcome, Gerard. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you, Rich. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to introduce our speaker today, who I first met in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, when he arrived in San Francisco to begin some of his initial research here. So it's been a real pleasure to follow the progress of his work on this uh, subject and to see his uh, book emerge and to see the life that it has taken on. So Rich is a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. 
He received his master's and his doctorate degrees at the University of Oxford and was a postdoctoral fellow at King's College, London. His historical research on patient zero has been published not only in the book that we'll be discussing today, but also in the Bulletin of the History of Medicine and as part of an interdisciplinary research article in the journal Nature. Uh, he's currently working part-time as a research fellow, spending the rest of his working time in private practice as a credentialed career and life coach. Since 2012, Rich has served as a policy development officer uh, on the executive committee of the Society for the Social History of Medicine. And last year, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Uh, the, this past year, he has published writing on the social history of medicine and its values on unhelpful references to patient zero. We'll be talking a bit about that in the discussion after he presents. Uh, and with Erica Charters on the history of science and medicine in the context of COVID-19. He's currently working with colleagues to develop a community-centered research project examining COVID-19 and uh, con contact tracing practices related to COVID-19 and the public responses to them. And with that, I'll hand off to Rich to, to present his book. Well, thank you very much, Gerard, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to be with you today. And before I start, I just wanted to say that I've been thinking a lot about uh, San Francisco residents today and dealing with uh, wildfires that are nearby. Um, I'm based in the UK right now, uh, but I'm from Vancouver and uh, in British Columbia in recent years, we've had increased uh, exposure and um, being affected by the smoke and the damage of wildfires. And I know how uh, upsetting and um, unsettling it can be to have that in an environment um, that you love. So my thoughts and thoughts go out to you and I, I hope that the situation improves and that there is an increased will to address the climate change issues uh, that are uh, fueling uh, the increase of events like this. Um, I normally uh, do a reading from the book to help situate myself as author to it. So I've, I'm, I'm going to uh, do the established route, which is to read a section from the introduction of the book. Um, which uh, talks about how I became interested and um, uh, captivated by this history. And um, the second reading will be, I'll say a little bit more about that in, the se in a second, but the second reading comes from the fourth chapter, which is after uh, Randy Schultz's And the Band Played On comes to prominence and starts to circulate um, and the idea of patient zero, that one man may have caused the North American AIDS epidemic, perhaps through deliberate behavior, um, began to circulate even more. And perhaps Lee could put on the first slide, uh, which will give uh, viewers some of Isaac Tobin's wonderful cover art for the book. And uh, while I do um, my first reading. Who gets to name? How do they see the world? How do they represent what they see? To whom? A resolute belief in the importance of these questions and the impact they have on the practices of making science and writing history moves me to place myself as this book's author more explicitly into the frame. Like all other knowledge creators, I bring to this book my own subjectivity, a particular worldview shaped by my own historically situated experiences which in turn has influenced at some levels consciously and at other levels less so the history I have written. As a white middle-class teenager coming of age in the 1990s in a suburban city near Vancouver, Canada, my understanding of sexual contact was always informed with an awareness of the risks of HIV and other sexually transmissible diseases. Less clear to me at that time was my own sexuality which by the time I, that I neared the completion of my undergraduate degree at the University of British Columbia, was urgently pressing me to acknowledge that I was attracted to other men. Though remaining closeted to friends, colleagues, and family members, 
I began a sexual relationship with a handsome male graduate student I met at one of Vancouver's few gay nightclubs. And for those who have visited, this isn't in the book, uh, it was the Odyssey. Shortly thereafter, having imbibed the message that responsible sexual health rested upon regular testing for STDs, we went together for what I had assumed to be a regular checkup at a local community-based gay health clinic. My assumption proved to be incorrect when the results returned. The community nurse, after asking whether I thought that I might in fact be HIV positive, informed me that the test indicated that I had contracted HIV my new partner tested negative. Three very stressful months of further tests and much waiting eventually confirmed that I had been the recipient of a false positive diagnosis. My initial result, an indeterminate combination of a positive screening test and a negative confirmation test, raised the possibility that I had been recently infected and had not created enough antibodies to be read by the confirmation test. As time and further testing proved, a far less likely scenario had occurred. I was one of a very small percentage of individuals whose blood cross-reacted with the highly sensitive ELISA screening test. Though I had not been exposed to HIV, my blood yielded a falsely positive test result. This experience at the age of 22 was profoundly transformational on a personal level. At the time of my diagnosis, despite it taking place in the same city where only a few years earlier the announcement of new therapy regimes had heralded a transformation of the disease, my mind conjured up older and more resilient notions. HIV leading to early death, infection with the virus as a consequence of gay sex. Spending several months thinking of myself as HIV positive sensitized me to fears of dying young and social rejection to a sense of self-pollution, and to a radically diminished sense of self-worth. Though, in retrospect, I can see that I faced these challenges from a position of relative social and economic privilege, the experience often seemed overwhelming at the time. It shattered my previously untroubled confidence in scientific progress and medical authority, and introduced a far more critical engagement with the media's representations of disease. Not long after this experience, I read And the Band Played On for the first time and became transfixed by Randy Schultz's accounts of the 1980s medical and social struggles that forged subsequent understandings of the disease. I was also seduced by his dark depiction of the flight attendant who had spent the last year of, the life, of his life in my hometown. The 16 years in between this triggering personal incident and my completion of my own book have seen me relocate to the United Kingdom for further study and research, with a significant amount of that time spent grappling with the multifaceted story of patient zero. A commitment to exposing the ways in which knowledge is created, particularly in a work that uses biography as a contextualizing explanatory tool, means that it is important that readers be aware of this background. No scientific or historical account is neutral, nor any author objective though these caveats do not foreclose a rigorous commitment to honesty and truth. For my second reading, as I mentioned previously, it's moving to the fourth chapter of the book. Maybe I'll situate it a little bit more. So, um, the introduction of patient zero and the making of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, situates uh, what the state of knowledge was in 1982 at the very beginning of the epidemic and weaves in different threads of literatures that talk, whether medical, epidemiological, uh, sociological, that talk about AIDS. Um, chapter one looks at earlier histories of infectious disease and the way that uh, Western societies in Europe and North America talked about um, infection and epidemics and uh, talked about the people who were infected. Um, and looking at, uh, I argue, the way that a number of themes that characterized those earlier representations of epidemics became um, fused together in the presentation of uh, Gaetan Dugas as patient zero. And uh, so the echoes of these earlier 
uh, themes uh, came out. And so that's what I explore in chapter one. Chapter two is a deep dive into the epidemiological studies carried out in the early 1980s as researchers from the Centers for Disease Control and elsewhere were trying to understand what this new mysterious disease was and their eventual interest in um, a flight attendant and his travels and the potential that he might uh, play, pose um, answer some questions they might have about what caused AIDS and how it was transmitted. Chapter three looks at um, Randy Schiltz and his role in investigating and writing, investigating the AIDS epidemic and writing and the band played on, which as meant most of the attendees today will know is a pivotal and influential account of the early years of the AIDS epidemic in the United States. And chapter four looks at the widening social response, the immediate aftermath of the publicity campaign that was used to promote and the band played on uh, amidst fears that the book would not launch, it would not capture a wide audience. And so there was a push, uh, a sensationalized push to use a story that the media could not fail to ignore and use that as a way of bringing the book to a, a broad audience. And so the, this section um, draws from this period where um, I look at the way that photographs of Gaetan Dugas circulated with the story of, of him being not only perhaps the one of the original cases of AIDS in North America, the story went, but also uh, responsible for transmitting uh, HIV deliberately to uh, many of his sexual partners. Um, so the story went. And before I launch into the reading, I might as well finish up what, what the rest of the book does. I imagine we'll touch on this in the discussion, but the last two chapters were an attempt on my part to reintegrate a uh, Canadian experience um, into a story that had often been told from an American perspective. And um, uh, chapter six in particular um, tries to peel away all the different layers of myth and legend and uh, miscommunication and um, willful uh, misrepresentation to see if it would be possible to uh, establish uh, a more balanced and fair perspective on what Gaetan Dugas' experience of this unknown um, and without much context, new disease um, before all the layers of meanings about AIDS were imposed upon it. So that gives you an idea of the overall book. I'm gonna backtrack to chapter four and just talk a little bit about the circulation of some images. And I see that Lee has very kindly put up the first photo, which is great. The photographic portrait of Gaetan Dugas in People magazine in December 1987 would receive the widest circulation and deployment of any photograph depicting him, appearing as it did in the magazine and weeks earlier on 60 Minutes. As such, it is illuminating to examine the picture and its wide travels. The image viewers see most clearly shows the flight attendant in a moment of apparently good physical health, tanned, muscled, and lean. Given the emphasis in Schiltz's popular history and the surrounding publicity that Dugas had lured hundreds of men into sexual liaisons, it should not be surprising that this photo would be used the most frequently to, to depict his physical appeal. As it appears in 60 Minutes, the image has a slightly awkward composition, with the lower edge of frame clipping Dugas' right arm at the elbow, left forearm at the wrist, and most of his lower body at the waist. By contrast, a distant view of the image, held later by the host Harry Reasoner in a medium over the shoulder shot as he interviewed one of Dugas' former lovers, one is able to see that this was not its original composition, but rather a cropped view, 
a reduction possibly imposed by producers wary of broadcasting standards and not wanting to engage with complaints about the depiction of Dugas groin, clad in what appears to be a bodybuilder's posing pouch. It seems likely that the original image was a five by seven inch photograph, probably belonging to one of Dugas' former lovers, a memento sent by the flight attendant while he was out of town. In this sense, Dugas was like many other gay men of the period, who sent letters and postcards with enclosed photographs of themselves to distant friends and lovers. The image was wrenched from this originally private realm, one which acknowledged the physical, sexual relationship connecting two men, and thrust into an overwhelmingly public and disembodied setting, broadcast to millions of North American viewers in their homes. This dislocation is amplified by the cropping the photograph underwent, first by the producers of 60 Minutes, and then in its subsequent incarnations. An even smaller version was printed in People magazine. Its appearance now approached that of a standard head and shoulders shot, although due to differences of shading and the original angle of the photograph, Dugas' necklace head rather looks as if, it, as if it has been removed from another body and glued onto a new set of shoulders. The photographer's identity was permanently erased with a caption for the image reattributing the credit, photographed by CBS News, 60 Minutes. People Magazine's international circulation facilitated the wide diffusion of this photograph, literally presenting Dugas as the face of AIDS, a popular theme in news feature reporting throughout 1987. The owner of one particular copy apparently thought that Dugas personified the group that was responsible for the epidemic. Such was the force of his or her conviction that this person, photocop that this person photocopied the magazine page, annotated it, and mailed this palimpsest to the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, in whose archived records it now rests. One can scarcely think of a more different motive for this mailing than the one that may have brought the picture from Dugas to a lover. The original article presents Dugas as a missing link to researchers, when in 1987, it was clear that the links he represented in the early cluster study were deeply problematic, given the current knowledge of HIV incubation periods. The article likely suggested other links to the person mailing the photo too given the immediate historical context. In the past year, Lyndon LaRouche had spearheaded a restrictive initiative in California to test and track down people with AIDS. Just weeks before, on October 14th, Senator Jesse Helms was fighting in Congress to remove funding from gay-run AIDS prevention services and declared, every AIDS case can be traced back to a homosexual act. In this context, the reader who annotated and mailed the image was able to view Dugas slash patient zero as the ultimate embodiment of guilt and the, ca the cause of the epidemic. In some instances then, by delivering to conservatives an exaggerated model of gay male sexuality and the band played on and the publicity surrounding it managed to fan the flames of a movement Schultz and his editor Michael Dennedy were hoping to counter. Of the image's many subsequent apparitions, some more public than others, three in particular are worth mentioning. The first, retitled Proud Lives, appeared in a gay magazine in Vancouver in an article showing solidarity for fallen community members. In contrast to the People magazine piece, which focused on Dugas' fierce sexual drive, which gave impetus to an epidemic, this defiant entry attempts to reclaim Dugas' reputation, offering him instead as one of the founders of AIDS Vancouver's support group. The second, a rather audacious and self-congratulatory half-page advertisement by California Magazine in the New York Times, praised its scoop of running the Patient Zero story as an article before any other publication. This had been one of the earliest sales for any part of Schiltz's book. In this version, we see that Dugas' head has been removed from its original shoulders and pasted onto a body dressed in a suit and tie to give the semblance of a flight attendant's identity badge, complete with a forged signature 
And the almost comically ironic phrase, given the frequent recycling of this particular image, not transferable. If anything, this advertisement only served to amplify the impression that Dugas had single-handedly launched the American AIDS epidemic, which raised the ire of some AIDS activists. I really like this slide, which I think is especially appropriate um, given that it's held at the GLBT Historical Society as part of its AIDS ephemera collection. Protesters from a San Francisco chapter of ACT UP reproduced the advertisement in a call to action for their members. In each of these occurrences, one sees an image that has been seized by, different, by certain groups and deployed according to their particular agendas. In each, Dugas' status as a patient and his role as a sick person in a new epidemic was contested his image used to give force and to pers pers personalize each party's claims. As picture and story traveled across the continent and overseas, reaching new publics, they took on new meanings and significance. And that's the end of my second reading. Um, the last slide um, shows the final slide, the ne there we go, um, shows uh, a, a kind of an afterlife of the book. Um, as right as it was published, um, a Canadian producer um, purchased the rights to make it into a documentary film. And over the next, oh, probably uh, 14 months or so, uh, really uh, intense effort to, uh, very quick compared to the uh, you know, over a decade of, of researching and writing the book uh, to bring a documentary uh, into, uh, into the world. And uh, so this is the poster for the film. Um, it will be screening as part of the Frameline Festival um, later this month. Um, and that should be viewable to any resident of California. And I believe uh, we have a trailer linked up for that. Um, so uh, why don't we play the trailer for the documentary film and that might then fuel some questions, conversations and discussion uh, with Gerard. The 70s were just fabulous. You know, not only was all the with sex. All through the 70s, sex was kind of the gay man's obligation. We thought that sex was good for you. Like hell. I got very clearly, I think, that uh, Gaytan liked having encounters that were no responsibility. Gaytan actually told me that. He had a project of having sex with a different man every night. You know, it's very easy to fall into the hedonistic side because it's intoxicating, but there was a price to pay, I think, for that. Um, and then it just got awful. It got worse and worse and worse from that moment on. I wish I'd never heard that term, gay cancer. I was totally paranoid and scared shitless. I was in a state of perpetual paranoia. And so was everybody. Everybody thought, oh my God, I've got it. AIDS didn't just happen, it was allowed to happen. Essentially, Gaetan in Vancouver was the personage, the face of AIDS. And it just seemed so ludicrous. And really that idea of patient zero as a figure, as a popular term, comes from and the band planned on. And I told him, no, don't do this. This is not a good idea. You shouldn't name patient zero. And I use everybody's name. He's not singled out at all. I think I make it put the disease on much more of a human scale. Really? This, this is all one person's fault? It felt like scapegoating to me. I thought like, oh, who's this poor guy that they're trying to blame this all on? Patient zero. 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 Patient zero.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Rich. The uh, film looks fantastic. I'm looking forward to seeing it at Frameline. Uh, and so let's, um, as soon as I can get my questions up here. There we are. So now let's just do a little bit of discussion. Uh, Rich and I will talk a bit. I have a few questions for him and then we're going to open it up to everybody participating online because I'm sure many of you have uh, memories, uh, comments uh, and questions as well. So to start out, uh, Rich, given that our discussion today is sponsored by the GLBT Historical Society, can you tell us a bit about how you use the society's archives as part of your research process for the book? Mm, that's a good question. And I should say, I think the first time I became aware of the GLBT Historical Society was when we encountered each other for the first time, which would have been at the Pride Parade Festival in June 2007. I had already done some, uh, a little bit of a research trip um, in the previous December to the San Francisco Public Library and its collections, um, which host a bulk of the uh, the Schultz papers. Um, but when I then started speaking with you and I, I, I of course, uh, found, found myself attracted, drawn to a, a table uh, that, that was um, representing historical work and archives in San Francisco. Um, I, you, I'm pretty sure you said, well, actually, we've got, we've got some Schultz's papers too. Um, and uh, it would be well worth a visit. And um, so that, w on that trip, I mean, that was the first of many trips to San Francisco to uh, divide my time, it seemed. I, it feels like I was constantly um, traveling between uh, Civic Center and the archives to uh, make use of both collections and seeing, seeing how, uh, I don't know, getting, inspiration from talking with some of the community archivists, getting their sense about what, you know, what collections to consider looking for, uh, looking through and pull, pulling up material. And, and frankly, sometimes just the, the long slog of going through page after page after page. Um, so uh, in many ways, um, archival research uh, has not moved much from its 19th century uh, kind of uh, formative, formative years. Although um, I have been, um, I've been thinking recently about a recent project uh, to digitize some of these collections, um, some of the AIDS collections um, hosted in archives across the Bay Area to provide a more integrated experience. And I'm not sure where that, where that project is yet, um, but man, I would have loved to have had access to that um, back in 2006, 2007, when I was starting to do this. Um, but the, the, there is a real richness to the, uh, the society's collections um, and I think a diversity that, uh, and just a range that you don't often see at know, more formal um, institutional collections. Um, so that was, that was a, a real joy as well. Excellent. Now, you, of course, also did research at other queer community-based archives, at university libraries, at public libraries, and in a variety of other settings. And I'm wondering, based on your experience of those different kinds of institutions and following up a little bit on what you just said, would you say that queer history, public history institutions, such as the Historical Society and the other queer archives, uh, around North America and beyond have a unique role to play in supporting the production of historical knowledge about the LGBTQ past. Absolutely. As, a, as in terms of a unique role, um, I think without a doubt. Um, I mean, first and foremost, given the proximity that many of these community-based um, collections have to the community, there are, um, I'd say, less um, restrictions perhaps in terms of uh, the gatekeeping that other institutions might have and and possibly as well a kind of a more creative and inclusive understanding about what 
items and articles are, would, would belong in such collections. Um, I'm also thinking about kind of the, the uniqueness this, this, some of this can be changing as well. I'm aware of in different cities, community-based collections, many are kind of coming out of late 70s um, gay liberation activism into early in 80s, kind of, in, uh, kind of informed and influenced by the rise of conservative forces that would be trying to silence some of these histories. Um, that these really were labors of love. And um, the, on the one hand, the institutional spaces that they have to work in um, are sometimes uh, less secure in terms of a location, you know, being able to cover rent, um, being able to be in the same, same place for an extended period of time or having to move, um, not being able to afford air conditioning, uh, which I'm thinking about um, some swelteringly hot days I spent in Montreal at um, the Archive Gay um, there. Um, so some of some, uh, the physical, and, and also I'm, I'm thinking as well, the r really unique uh, experience of the BC Gay and Lesbian Archives, which um, I didn't realize until I went that it was uh, the, the uh, the reading room was the the entire archives are housed were housed until very recently in um, the ap apartment in the downtown uh, West End uh, apartment of the archivist and uh, some very creative storage units uh, were screened in the bedroom and the reading room was the kitchen table I mean so that that gives you an idea of the the in some places the labor of love that and commitment on the, the part of these often volunteer run organizations. Um, and I, I, I can't help but think that that does create a unique space, uh, a, uh, an important uh, role for these institutions. The, a question that pops into my mind is um, how, how that quality will be able to be maintained as some of these collections pass into pass from the original founders into more institutionalized settings like formal libraries or larger archives um, so that might be something, something to think about indeed it's a story to follow in the coming years yeah. let's let's turn now to look a little bit at the specifics of the book and i think it would be safe to say that the book centers around twinned figures, as it were, of Gaetan Dugas, the so-called Patient Zero, and Randy Schultz, the internationally known journalist who made use of Dugas, and I would say as a character in his book, uh, and the band played on. So one of the tasks you undertake in your book, uh, particularly in the final chapter, is restoring a measure of humanity to Gaetan Dugas, a man who uh, bears little resemblance in your present to the caricatural monster of Patient Zero portrayed uh, in the Schultz book. Uh, can you summarize just a little bit your findings about Dugas and uh, why you think it's valuable for us to consider him and his story in a more complex and nuanced way? I was having a conversation with a colleague recently um, and we were both reflecting on how we were really appreciative of the work of an Italian historian, Carlo Ginsberg. Um, and in particular, there was a book that he wrote, uh, The Cheese and the Worms, um, where he set about to recreate as best as possible the intellectual life and views of a early modern uh, miller. So, uh, uh, essentially a poor person uh, whose views would not have mattered um, to those in power at the time. And his approach was to use the records that were compiled as part of the Inquisition and their uh, attempts to stamp out any kind of heretical thinking, uh, which produced very, very detailed notes. And the strategy, his strategy was to try to read those notes against the grain to try to uh, 
uh, create a full and uh, vividly recreated portrait of, of this man in this time and to try and recover this. And it struck me that that approach, um, when I found out that Randy Schiltz had left voluminous notes in his collection, it struck me that there might be the possibility to, re to take somebody who acquired a lot of information about Gaetan Dugas and wrote what seemed to me and to many other critics who came before me, um, a very slanted and polarizing picture. So I was interested in seeing whether it might be possible. And this was before I knew whether it would be possible to interview and encounter anybody who had known Gaetan. Um, starting out on the process, you don't really know what you're going to find. There's a lot of hope that kind of animates it. It's, it's also kind of part of the excitement of doing the historical work is you, you, you going on the hunt and seeing what needles in the haystack you might find. Um, and I think at one point um, early on, I may have, I think in a, I might have been viewing things in a, in a more black and white way myself and kind of taking on some of the, the criticisms that Schiltz's most ardent critics had directed at him, kind of thinking, man, I think maybe Gaetan Dugas was totally framed. It's, you know, it's a complete misrepresentation. And, you know, this, he was, he was, you know, an angel and like, what? and um, as, as time went on, I was, I was encouraged by the amount of information that I was able to find both in Schultz's records, but then bit by bit um, encountering people who knew and were after a lot of trust building on my part, were willing to uh, share their recollections. Um, and so the picture that I was then able to re recreate was different from the one that Schiltz did. And as I talk about in the book, Schiltz came to believe that um, the Gaetan Dugas was a sociopath and he interpreted his actions in a very uh, black and white way. And I also show in the book that he uh, interpreted his actions in a way that is, was uh, not very sensitive to the what was known at the time about um, AIDS uh, and its possible causes. Um, and so I should also say, very briefly, that another really important book for me at this time as I was conceiving the project was um, Judith Wal Walzer-Levitt's book on Typhoid Mary. Uh, where she really takes seriously the notion that uh, Mary Mallon, the cook who features in kind of the myth, uh, the story of um, somebody deliberately uh, or in being seen to deliberately infect and um, hurt other people with their actions, and take really examine how difficult it might have been for Mary Mallon to have an entire system of knowledge about how disease is transmitted change around her. So a paradigm is sh shift is essentially happening around, pivoting around this woman and the difficulties of trying to respond to that when people are pointing to her as the evidence for this change happening. And it seemed resonant that so something like that would have happened for Gaetan Dugas as well and it seemed worthwhile to explore it and to think, well, what would it, if we follow it along from his perspective and his understanding that he had been diagnosed with cancer and then finding himself really at the center of, uh, of, of a storm of uh, speculation and uh, criticism, um, what that might've been like. And so, all of those reasons kind of came together as, a, as a grounds for finding more information about Gaetan, um, more balanced uh, portrayal of him. Um, because, I mean, ultimately, I don't think it's helpful to, to think of people as monsters. Um, I mean, if you do, that presents a very clear uh, explanation for why they behave in a certain way, but it's not necessarily that convincing. So finding a more nuanced explanation, I think does everybody a greater service.
and is more historically sensitive as well. Excellent, thank you, Rich. And then let's turn to the other twin in the book, which is Randy Schultz himself, uh, who was well known professionally and personally to many queer community members, members and AIDS activists uh, here in San Francisco. And some of the AIDS activists and queer activists here at the time actually referred to him as journalist zero uh, in response to what they saw his, as his role in fabricating and spreading the patient zero myth and making other highly dubious claims about AIDS uh, in his reporting. So my question is, having looked in depth at his work and at his archives and at the context around him, did he merit the praise that he received from many in the mainstream media? And did he merit the harsh criticism he faced from AIDS and queer activists? Or can you come down somewhere in a more complex place much as you did with, uh, with Gaetan Dugas? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think Schiltz undoubtedly deserves praise for the work that he produced in And the Band Played On in terms of its, the power of its writing, the number of story threads that he is able to weave together and to carry through, and the impact that the book had in terms of uh, helping to shift the balance into, uh, for, uh, you know, across the United States and beyond in terms of establishing a readable account um, to give light and heart to um, this deadly epidemic, um, which, I mean, there are kind of interesting parallels to be made with COVID, but um, the, the extent to which it was not discussed and thousands of Americans and you know, people around the world, but Americans in particular, it seemed initially to be um, an American centered um, epidemic that thousands were dying without much of a response at all from those in power um, seems very different. And so his ability to shift, to move the dial on that with his writing and with his I guess, almost, I mean, just in the trailer we saw when he was speaking there, the, the kind of his, his energetic, frenetic kind of uh, commitment to his writing and his journalism, um, I think he does deserve uh, a great deal of credit. Um, that being said, he also <laughs> deserves a lot of criticism too. And one of the, I mean, I was aware I guess increasingly as time went on, as I was doing my research, that I had kind of taken on a bit of a sacred, sacred cow for some people. And The Band Played On is the book about how the first years of the epidemic um, unfolded. And it has made famous many of the people who are in it. And it kind of it burnishes their legacies. And um, some people, uh, uh, to take very, <laughs> they do not take, uh, take well to the notion of criticizing Schiltz's writing or Schiltz himself or presenting him as a more complex historical character. When I was editing and writing, especially the chapters on, on Randy, um, I did ask myself of, I said, have I, have I unintentionally done to Randy what he did to Dugas? And I ultimately feel that I have been kinder to, uh, kinder to Randy than he was to Gaetan. Um, and I mean, this is a difference in terms of the way that we, um, our disciplinary backgrounds, he was a journalist, I'm a historian, so um, he wouldn't uh, footnote every, every source, every claim, whereas that's something that um, historians kind of obsessively do. Um, so it's probably easier to fact check my work than it was his. And so one of the things that I, I would like him to receive um, rightful criticism or the grain of salt um, uh, engagement is that 
he got stuff wrong. I mean, not, I mean, some, some stuff and it was, I mean, very strong bias on his parts on how things should or should not have done and how people should or should not have behaved. Um, and also uh, his, and this is, this is definitely an advantage that historians have in terms of it, it is a much more settled past, but when you're in the moment, his was largely an oral account, doing lots of oral interviews with people, taking notes furiously, um, and sometimes he would miss, miss changes in, he would conflate details that would pe pe people would say, and so there, there, there are errors in And the Band Played On um, that I would wish uh, for readers to kind of to, to say, okay, it's a really good start, but we ought not to take this as the Bible on 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 this period. Um, so anyway, that that gives you an idea of. Uh, I think I think both are merited. I'll 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 take a down the middle response on that one. You're here. So let's now let's turn a bit to how history might help us see. Uh, our current situation. Uh, the first chapter of your book, as you mentioned, sort of looks back at how uh, epidemics have been reacted to in Western society over a long history going back to the Middle Ages and what kind of cultural heritage of meaning production and ways of reacting to, to such circumstances we have received from that. Uh, with AIDS now added to the list, uh, how can we currently deal with this current second pandemic of our lifetimes uh, in a more critical way, perhaps, by thinking about that long history and particularly about the recent history of the AIDS epidemic? What might it help us do in terms of perceiving our current circumstances differently? Mm. That's an excellent question. Um, I mean, in some ways, I would suggest that humans are in very predictable creatures in terms of the way that uh, responses um, seem at times to follow patterns. The, the desire to uh, match uh, or to overlay um, questions of causation of where did something come from with uh, the desire to attribute blame to kind of go really close together uh, not usually helpful um, but that tend that follows kind of seems to follow predictable patterns of finding the external source the external country or the desired external group to target and blame um, and so certainly, uh, I know that earlier in the epidemic, many Asian Americans and Asian, um, people whose ancestors were uh, from Asian countries in other parts of the world, uh, received a lot of blame for, um, I mean, and prejudice, uh, and I mean, physical attacks as well, um, in a way that seemed to be a very simplistic overlaying of, uh, imagined origin and uh, proximate connection to the person who who would then have this response um, i was i've been i was thinking about uh where there might be a difference and compared to the uh initial response to hiv or to aids pre-HIV, before it was fully realized that a virus was causing it, was the extent to which the uh, religious explanations for um, attributing blame to the groups that were most affected uh, really seemed to uh, characterize one thread of the response that seems to be less, you know, at least in the circles that I'm, the news that I'm consuming, it seems to be less prevalent. Um, And I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I, I think it's, it's always difficult for historians to, uh, to kind of interpret the present um, with uh, a lot of clarity. Um, but in, in some ways, it seems like this may be another example of uh, human 
incursion into uh, animal habitats and uh, in, in a dangerous and damaging way, uh, creating opportunities for um, viruses to, to break out of their you know, contained habitats and, um, and cause a lot of harm. Um, and so that would be my kind of my first stab at, at answering that question. Excellent. I'm also thinking of the uh, article that you published recently in the conversation titled Patient Zero, Why It's Such a Toxic Term. And that draws on some of the reactions from AIDS to help us sharpen our thinking about the coronavirus pandemic. Could you summarize a little bit your argument uh, in that article and some thoughts more generally about if, whether there are frameworks that you developed in thinking critically about the history of the AIDS crisis that might help us stand back and think critically about our current situation? Well, in that article, it was written in response to seeing a number of news stories, tweets, uh, people looking for the patient zero, a patient zero, and use, and essentially uh, having written a book about the misuse of this phrase and how it how it developed over time to to kind of <laughs> essentially feel the futility of having done undertaken this exercise and seeing the same kind of responses come out again, it seemed like a good opportunity to present a very digested view of the of the argument and kind of say that actually we often use the the term phrase patient zero to mean um, a number of different things and usually there's a better uh, terminology to use for each one of them. So I go into a little bit about the, the different misuses. Um, I do a very short summary of the way that the term patient zero, I mean I think one of the strongest arguments against using it um, in any kind of reliable way is that people, <laughs> if you knew that a term was coined by accident to mean, mean something that it was never intended to mean, you shouldn't then be using it as a specific um, uh, way to designate um, uh, a, a case. Um, and, and then the last, the last piece is looking at the uh, kind of the, the legacy of the cluster study and kind of unpicking a really pivotal image of um, that many, I, I mean, it's included in my book. It's um, of uh, the CDC's study that they carried out in 1982 and published in 1984, where they ha you have a, a, a network, a sexual network represented uh, with, with balls and spokes. And right in the middle of the diagram is the man who was identified as patient O, but misprinted in that article, misread later as patient zero. And um, many, people have misread what that diagram was supposed to be saying. And it serves as a reminder of uh, the challenges of understanding data as it's unfolding in the moment. And it's often not until months or years later that we see the limitations of what we think we're seeing. And very often uh, the first case that might present itself that people might think, oh, that's patient zero, uh, says nothing about many asymptomatic cases that may have preceded that one. People who may have been infected at the same time, but one got sick and presented with symptoms earlier. Um, so it just, it was trying to introduce an element of more critical thinking um, to the phrase and to highlight that when people use the phrase, it is often uh, accompanied, under, underwritten by a an impulse to blame and to be aware of what's going on when that when that happens. Um, to be I, I, people in the chat, I've provided a link to the article that we're discussing. There is really well worth reading. So now let's open up to comments and questions from our online participants. We have a half hour left in the program, just on time we wanted to be. And I know that many of the people taking part lived through the darkest years of the AIDS crisis. Uh, many people followed Randy Schultz's work as he was producing it uh, and as his career was developing. And some people uh, taking part actually knew him personally. So I'm 
hoping people feel free to share memories, observations, as well as questions. And I also want to emphasize that for people who are younger, who were not yet of age or not yet born when Randy was doing his work, uh, that you have something crucial to compute as well. Your observations from a different durational perspective help us understand what was happening in that period. And your questions help us sharpen our, sharpen our thinking about it. So you have just as much to contribute as those of us who are veterans. Uh, so please jump in now and we'll hope to take uh, questions from a number of folks. Uh, and Lee, our uh, museum experience manager is is helping us manage this part. So Lee, if you see questions we want to bring up, meanwhile, I'll take a look at, um, at some of the ones that have already been asked and we'll see if we can raise some of those as well. Let's see if I can get back to our earliest questions here. Some of these are quite detailed, others are more interesting. Uh, so one of our participants asks about uh, Schultz dramatizing uh, Gaetan Dugas, quote, dark inner world, unquote, uh, as he continues infecting people, insisting that he knew that he was harming them, and is wondering, Rich, if you, in your research you came across uh, clear ideas about where Schultz arrived at this understanding of Gaetan's inner life, or was he largely creating a villain uh, to serve his narrative purposes? Uh, without really having direct access to what uh, the experience of Gaetan Duga was like. So, the, the research that Randy did in New York City on one of his trips seems to have been quite pivotal in shaping what he saw as Duga's legacy. Um, in which he interviewed back-to-back -back Michael Callan, um, who was a prominent AIDS activist. But in that interview, Michael Callan was talking about what seemed to be a decline in sexual ethics and um, it being kind of like an every man for themselves out of the baths and that people wouldn't, weren't looking after each other. And, and so as Schultz is putting together this picture of uh, patient zero, um, perhaps being a figure, because he knew of this, this individual being uh, a concern in San Francisco because of his interviews with Selma Dritz, uh, the public health, um, the epidemiologist in San Francisco who was doing much of the contact tracing and who'd had a confrontation with Duga uh, where she, later recollected essentially said you need to stop having sex with people we know it's sexually transmissible because of you because of your example we know that it's sexually transmissible and he duga threw that back in, in her face and said i'm you know i'm i'm not going to listen to you and i'm not going to take that evidence um on board the next interview that Schultz did in New York. I might be switching the, my, the details are in the book. I might be switching the two in my mind, but they were kind of back to back was with uh, Paul Popham, who um, I think there is footage of him in the documentary film uh, when you see it, because he came to Vancouver as a guest speaker in 1983 to talk about um, the, um, to, about how bad the epidemic was and the activities of gay men's health crisis. Anyway, in 1986, Schiltz is interviewing Paul Popham, and Paul Popham is dying of AIDS. And I, as Schiltz later recounted it, it was that he was seeing Paul Popham's wasting visage um, uh, impacted by the, the virus. And, was, and when Paul was talking about Gaetan Dugas and that he was the individual uh, identified as patient zero, um, that Randy saw that it was Dugas' legacy. It was Dugas' virus that had infected Paul and was killing him and wondered how many others it, he, it, he had killed with his virus. Um, and through a series, so there is, there is no, um, I mean, the best I could say would be it's, it's an armchair psychologist approach to, to, to thinking about 
how uh, Gaetan was uh, was going about his life. And I mean, I, I mentioned it in chapter three of, of my book. I mean, I might even pull it out. Um, one of the, the strongest examples of this um, kind of invented inner monologue um, was criticized um, by some readers because, I mean, it's very uh, lurid um, where there's a description of him, of Gaetan, um, luring somebody into a bathhouse um, cubicle and shutting the door. Um, and um, it was interesting to see the, 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 the part that was then excised from the book manuscript. And um, I'll just read, I'll read this passage out because I think it, it bears um, it speaks to this. As some critics were horrified by the presentation of Dugas in the book, and particularly the scene from November 1982 in the San Francisco Club Baths, they might have been outraged by an earlier draft. This earlier version is extraordinary for the extent to which it enlarges Schiltz's view of Dugas as a sociopath. Almost identically to the final manuscript, Schiltz described how Dugas chose a cubicle to enter in the bathhouse and waited for the ritual nod that indicated he would be welcome. Without speaking a word, the assignation was set and Dugas pushed the door shut. At this point, the final manuscript stops, as is the final in the book, a result of an editorial decision to strike through the following lines. Gaetan could barely restrain a giggle as the thought once again arched across his mind and a certain glint crossed his mischievous eyes. Maybe he would play his little joke with this one. So, I mean, that, that really does give you a sense of the, uh, the extent to which he was imagining and recreating um, and, uh, and, and perhaps as well, a very sensible editorial decision to, uh, ex to cross off that, that, that last passage. Indeed, and it's very generous of you to say imagining and recreating rather than fictionalizing, fabricating, uh, attributing intentions to someone he never interviewed and couldn't possibly know what their inner thoughts were. <laughs> generous on your part. Uh, we have another uh, question here from, um, let's see if I can see where it went, uh, from uh, Professor uh, Bill Gilders at Emory. Uh, mentioning that the other sort of twinning in the book is between Gaetan Dugas and uh, the personage of Bill Krauss as the gay sociopath versus the gay hero. And mm. Bill's asking if you could elaborate a little bit about how uh, Randy developed these characters and used them as, as archetypes or as, as character types in the book. Mm. Um, so it was really interesting. That's a good question. It was really interesting to see um, an early uh, book proposal that Schiltz, that Randy wrote in terms of uh, how he, I mean, it was a very well-written, compelling book proposal framing what he wanted to do, but making it very clear that he wanted to have a heroes and villains approach to writing the history. Um, and in this, he was very, he wrote and uh, said in interviews that he was very influenced by James Missioner. Um, whose works would, you know, deliberately take characters to represent certain social forces in history. Um, and that's what he wanted to do. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Krauss is in there as, um, maybe not as, as the everyman, but as um, a, you know, uh, as an important um, uh, force for change. Um, and there were a couple of other characters there as well, some, many of whom remained in the book. Some were dropped, um, as Schultz found better examples. And um, in not, maybe not intriguingly, but it makes sense. It, this, the proposal was written, if I recall, uh, in 1985. And uh, Schultz didn't really come into contact with um, the story of Patient Zero really become, he didn't start really chasing it until 1986. And uh, so the character of Gaetan Dugas is nowhere in the proposal. And yet the epidemic 
itself, the virus features, uh, kind of Schultz names it, it's like it itself is almost a character. Um, and it seems like some of the uh, darker attributes of the epidemic became then overlaid onto this newly discovered character of Gaetan Dugas in the final in the final book. But I mean, yeah, there is a real malevolence and uh, in the Schultz's characterization of Dugas that seems to have some of that legacy of the uh, the more generalized, mysterious, ghostly epidemic. And intriguing to hear you mention. Randy citing the novelist James Michener as his model. When I interviewed Randy for The Advocate in 1989, he brought that up as well. It was one of his standard talking points uh, of which he was proud. And I'm not sure that he understood that many journalists and certainly many historians thought that a uh, schlocky popular novelist was not the place to find your models for writing about the complexities of the real world. Uh, nowadays, I don't think that most people under 50 even know who James Michener is. Uh, but uh, go take a look at his work, folks, if you want to see uh, the model that Randy was using, not one of the great probing journalists with critical questions, not a historian, but a popular novelist who used characters to embody archetypes and tell stories through them. Uh, and I imagine, Rich, you might share my sense as a historian that no human beings actually embody archetypes. Uh, we're all far more messy than that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and so there are two there are two questions brought up here that I find interesting and having since you spent a lot of time with Schiltz's papers and talking to people who knew Schiltz, uh, you might have something to say about this. One person asks, curious about the role of internalized homophobia in Schiltz's decision to stigmatize the bad gays using Dugas to represent them as patient zero. And it twins uh, interestingly with another question in which a person asks, uh, what do you think of the idea that Schultz might have used Gaetan Dugas as a scapegoat to deflect blame away from the majority of LGBTQ people? So was it a reflection of his own self-hatred uh, to create this gay monster? Or was the gay monster instrumental in trying to drive people from thinking everybody was a gay monster? Or can we even put those questions together well? I, th I think we can put those questions together. Um, I'm, um, I'm very much struck by recalling reading through Randy's, Randy gave a lot of interviews. There was a huge amount of press attention to the Patient Zero story. And it, that, as I kind of mentioned, helped launch the book. And then, uh, which made Randy very uncomfortable because he, he later defended the Patient Zero story as, you know, excellent, very good uh, investigative journalism. But, and he, I mean, he, and he believed it too. However, he thought that the book's stronger achievements were talking about, you know, the breakdown or the lack of action uh, by the Reagan administration. Um, and that that was where his real strengths were. So it, it, it pained him to have this be the, the piece that got, got the attention. Um, but very interestingly, that his entire characterization or explanation for why Gaetan behaved the way that he did was he said that Gaetan had internalized homophobia, that Gaetan never accepted himself, hated the part of him that was gay, and was lashing out as a result of this. So it seems very interesting that R Randy took this model. Um, but as I write at, and kind of uh, include other critics, comments saying that Randy may have been really good at observing and writing about other people, but failed, did, was not as good at turning the spotlight and reflection onto himself. Uh, the second piece I think I can answer directly is that um, there's correspondence, I think I mention it in the book. I might not be able to find it right on the spot here. Um, but it was that Gaetan, in Randy's mind, was exemplified the type of irresponsible behavior that could be laid at the gay community's door, and that he felt it was vital to highlight that these actions happen, but they were a minority of the gay population. Uh, so he, I mean, it, 
it very much was a deliberate scapegoating move, and which he thought was he thought was justified because he thought it would uh, that it that there might be the problem that as there were increasing drives with the LaRouche initiative, et cetera, um, and I mean, calls for uh, people who were HIV positive to be tracked down, tattooed, put into concentration camps as anger was rising, he strategically thought that it was a good idea to um, separate out um, the people whose behavior, um, like Gaetan's, he thought was you know, beyond the pale. Another question that asked you to elaborate a little bit on what you found were Randy Schultz's sources for the story that he tells about Gaetan Dugas. And one of the questioners here asks quite reasonably if Schultz ever interviewed Gaetan Dugas or met him. So if you can give us a little bit of the story of where did this story come from? Mm. So it came in bits and pieces initially. And then, I mean, Another thing Schultz deserves credit for is, I mean, being an extremely hard worker. And once he kind of got the whiff of a story, would really diligently, you know, track it down. And so he, when he was motivated to, he would move really quickly. Um, and he was very skilled at kind of shaking the tree and finding uh, sources and tips to come, come back uh, to follow up with. And so it seems that, uh, he would have been aware of the cluster study in 1982-83, uh, probably more tail end of 82 into 83 uh, and later. Uh, there's material in his files from uh, a book, The Truth About AIDS, which was published in 84-85, um, where they talk about the cluster study and they talk about uh, an individual, um, they call him Eric in that book, but so these, the, he was aware of the story over time. He would have had conversations with Selma Dritz where she might have made reference to a man who was, you know, was problematic from her perspective because he was continuing to have sex. And then it took him a while to put those two together, that it was this the person that Selma Dritz was talking about was also the person who was the CDC's um, patient 57, patient O, the one subsequently misread as patient zero. And then when he realized that, he really mobilized his network. And so, whereas the doctors, whether it was Marcus Conant or who was uh, very involved um, in kind of starting out the Kaposi Sarcoma Foundation, which later became the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, or Selma Dritz, they would give him some details, but they wouldn't give him the name that he was looking for. But he then, because Randy was completely on top of the AIDS beat as a reporter, he would have known uh, a number of the people who were themselves were PWAs, so people living with AIDS. Um, and just said about interviewing them. And so uh, I think one of the earliest mentions of a name that I can find in his records was an interview that he did with Dan Turner, who was a local um, AIDS activist and uh, a writer, I believe, who lived in San Francisco. Um, and then he would build on that, um, talking, uh, asking on a trip to New York, uh, as I mentioned with Michael Callan and Paul Popham. And basically, he started asking people everywhere he, he went. And in a really, he was booked in to do a conference um, in Vancouver to talk about reporting on AIDS as a journalist and what that was like. And he saw an opportunity to ask around um, and find out information from locals there because Gaetan had spent the last year of his life based in Vancouver. And within about 24 hours um, from the end of his conference, presentation to his return to San Francisco later that weekend, he had assembled a huge amount of information from people who had known Gaetan um, to be able to piece together a story. But of course, Gaetan had died in 1984 and the two had never met. Uh, so he never interviewed Gaetan himself. We have another question here that, that asks for a judgment on your part. Uh, 
And uh, the uh, questioner is saying, I'm curious about how your current, uh, let's see if I can, I'm losing my place on the screen. Let's see if I can get back here, sorry. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, so curious about how you're, you currently value each of the major figures and the major choices. So let's say Schiltz and Gaetan Dugas, uh, that uh, your guild history is rife with morally complicated figures and choices. And one of the explicit or implicit ends of historical study is to reach some kind of sense of whether any given one of these uh, balances out as generally positive or negative. So for instance, your judgment on Schiltz's work uh, of what our questioner calls historical fiction. Did the good resulting from it outweigh the harm it caused? Ooh. So I, I, it's an interesting one and I'm, uh, I, might, I might sidestep the, the request for judgment because I think one of my primary motivations for doing this research is to promote understanding, which is slightly different than reaching judgment. Um, and, and I think that helps, that is, not always. I talked earlier about the understanding causation and uh, laying blame as being closely entwined when people seek to understand how epidemics start. And I, judgment comes very close to blame, and that's something I feel less comfortable doing. If I was to weigh out, uh, I mean, in the book, I, I uh, put it to... Michael Dennedy, who was the Schiltz's editor at St. Martin's Press, who um, has produced a lot of work, uh, was a really important figure in um, gay publishing through the 1970s, 1980s, gay publishing and uh, publishing more beyond, but one of the few gay men working in, in New York publishing at, uh, who was out at that time. Um, I, I asked him, like, did he have any regrets about, um, about, making the decision to pull out the patient zero story to promote it, which he kind of conceded for a long time as an act of yellow journalism, trying to, you know, use the media to print something to, to, to get a result. And he, he said, well, you know, if it was a sin, it was a small one. It, uh, and even with the, uh, the impact on Dugas' family, he kind of weighed it out and he said, well, you know, the man was dead. Um, you know, uh, it made a huge difference. And if I recall, he said, you know, I'd do it again. And so uh, depending, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if you were to ask any of Gaetan's surviving siblings, they might take a very different response to it. Um, so I, I'm, I, I, I don't know that it's possible. I don't know that I feel comfortable kind of uh, inhabiting a kind of moral compass that would be able to find the right way of weighing those two out. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it there, but return, end with my, my view of the kind of the importance of doing historical work to promote greater understanding. Here, here, we have, I think we'll do one last question. We have a great one that follows up directly on your reference to, to uh, Dugas' family uh, from Eric Sneathan, who's the coordinator of our uh, San Francisco ACT UP Oral History Project at the GLBT Historical Society, who says, thanks Rich for your amazing book. At the beginning of this talk, you mentioned that the last chapters are about reframing the story of Gaetan in the context of Canada. And I especially enjoyed reading Ray Redford's words uh, about Gaetan that close your book. I'm curious if you can say more about the about reframing Gaetan's story as a Canadian one, why that is important to think about and what it meant to you. Hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, Canadians, we love our American neighbors. Um, we often feel that we are either afterthoughts or not the center of the attention. And, and so to this Canadian looking at this story, it seemed that a large way in which um, the story of Patient Zero was either reported or then analyzed was of this foreigner coming in and bringing disease into the US. Um, and I mean, some of the news articles um, where it could almost be, you could almost read US as us. How did this happen to us? Um, 
and I, yeah, I think many Canadians would say, hey, yeah, we, we, we're, we matter too. And we've got, we've got our own history, we've got our own issues, problems, but, and, um, and it, it just, it seemed to be me that finding out more about Gaetan's background, it, the way that he fit into a Canadian history of gay activism, um, that you know didn't didn't necessarily hinge on Stonewall. That there were provincial uh, histories as well. That there was a legacy of bilingualism and uh, the role of you know needing to come to Vancouver to to practice take advantage of a new program of offering English instruction to Quebecers in another part. Like similarly to you, the the extension of uh french immersion english immersion i went to my, i was uh educated in a you know publicly funded school um in, in french immersion and that was an important part of my upbringing in british columbia um so it and and it seemed to me that the there there might be an opportunity as a gay man who'd come of age in vancouver you know a decade and a half after Gaetan had died, that there might be in my networks people that knew him and could attest to what he was like or reactions to him um, that would would offer a useful new perspective. So those are some of the reasons why it seemed that um, to this Canadian uh, that uh, a perspective that brought more of Canada in would be uh, would be important maybe to get get to a more North American um, understanding and also because um, you know he was a flight attendant and he traveled all over North America so it seemed to be a more integrative um, approach. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rich. I think we'll wrap up with that question. Let me remind folks that uh, the book is available on the University of Chicago Press website. I reread it uh, before doing this program, and it really is a fantastically good read. It's theoretically sophisticated, but it's super engaging. It's well written. I highly recommend it. And also take a look at the link uh, in the chat for Rich's article uh, in the conversation and finally for the upcoming uh, week or so of screenings of the documentary based on the book uh, at Frameline. If you're here in California, you can sign up uh, to buy tickets for for that showing as well. Thank you again so much, Rich, for joining us from, from the UK and uh, we will look forward to your progress on your next projects. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the chance to talk. Uh, one last shout out for the 20% discount voucher for the book, which is uh, available on the, it's on the uh, event listing. So uh, get your discount. Um, and yeah, uh, keep on. I want to just thank the, you and the society for the work that you do. Really important work uh, for preserving uh, queer history. And, uh, and it's a, a really special organization. And I, I look forward to, to having the chance to come back sometime. We'll look forward to seeing you once travel is possible again. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking part. And again, if you are not yet a member of the Historical Society, please consider joining. Your support makes these kinds of programs possible. Lee, I think we can go ahead and close down. <laughs>